Hi there, my name is David Batsoffen and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. At the moment I'm doing a series um, called In Conversation With, mainly because I currently find myself a non-traveling travel writer. Um, so today I have to take my travel vicariously through the likes of James Henry. James, how are you doing? Welcome to In Conversation With. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great what hat are what hat are you wearing today? Uh, today's current hat is one of, I suppose, Wildlife TV presenter. Right. Um, I've been working on uh, working on Safari Live or Wild Earth for the last little while, doing some freelance stuff there. And I've just released a book, so I guess I'm also author and, um, well, sometime musician. You can I, see I in the background. I see. We'll prevail upon you later. Maybe we can play out with a with a tune, as they say. Um, All right. So, so let, take us through your career. Did when you started out, a young James Henry, um, yes. matric. What what were your dreams and aspirations as a matric? You've just recently finished school. Where, what, when, and how? That's an interesting question. I, I mean, I had more hair than I do now, which um, sadly is gone. Um, it's, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. My father said to me, when you finish school, you will go and get a degree. I don't care what it is, but you will go and do one. And he said, I don't care where you do it, but it won't be in Johannesburg where you grew up because I don't want to know what's going on. So those are the only, bits of, those are the only instructions I had. Um, nice bit of parental advice there. <laughs> I thought so, yeah. And, you know, the only thing that I knew for sure, was that I wanted to live in a beautiful place. That was the only thing that I knew. I wasn't a naturalist. Uh, we weren't a family that went off camping, or we spent a bit of time in the bush, mainly in the Drakensberg, though. So I wasn't somebody who knew about the bush. Um, and then I went off to university and I did a degree in zoology and uh, rangeland science, called wildlife science. That was in Peter Maritzburg. And after that, I was. At equally at a loss and I was supposed to go I thought I'd go back to Johannesburg perhaps and try and be a musician and my I was seeing a girl at the time who was quite um who we'll, would we'll say strong-willed shall we say and she <laughs> said like a honey badgers is strong-willed yeah. and she she said we're going to the bush to be rangers so I didn't actually know what a ranger did I thought maybe they some kind of grass transect counting or you know, mammal transects or whatever it was. And I figured, you know what, what will happen is they'll interview us both. They'll keep, uh, send me back to Johannesburg and I'll be rid of two problems at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the cowardly way seldom works out. And, yep. you know, little while later, I found myself in a dr flooded drainage line during the floods of 2000 at Pinder Game Reserve. Um, and I was, I remember, to a profound memory, I was solely responsible for the lives of 18 strangers. So we, we all had a watch over the night. I had a torch that had cost me my last 10 rand, and it cast a sort of very dim glow on the, on the floor that much in front of me. And I was totally clueless as the rain pelted down around us, the fire went out, and I heard a lion calling in the distance. I remember that. And I remember thinking, this thing is going to come and kill everyone here. You know, <laughs> I, I had no idea that you could sleep safely in the bush at all. And, well, needless to say, that didn't happen. And this whole world of discovery opened up around me. Um, the honey badger went somewhere else, thankfully, and I stayed on. And <laughs> I became a guide thereafter because uh, I found out what a ranger does, of course. And, in, you know, in this, in this particular sense of the word, it's, it's a guide. So I started then taking game drives a little while later at Ngala Game Reserve, which is part of the Timbavati, part of the Kruger Park, uh, which was great. I spent five years there learning about the wilderness. And then I spent a bit of time at Londolozi after that. And then I went down to Cape Town and did a master's in human development where I spent time. Uh, I actually interviewed all of the staff at Londolozi, so it was about 250 back then, it's more than 300 now. And I went and visited their homes in the rural communities and 
the masters focused on the relationship between private game reserves and local people and how that relationship plays out. So that was very interesting and I think it's very important in South Africa to have that kind of understanding. Um, and then I did a bit of ranger training and then uh, yet again, I followed a girl back to Johannesburg. You just don't learn, do so you, James? Go. No, I don't. No, it wasn't me. <laughs> I didn't learn at all. And there I, I, I actually did teach the guitar and played as a musician, musician for five years and got very thin and very hungry trying to do that because if there's one way to lose weight. I can, you know, if anybody out there is trying to lose weight, become a musician or an actor, yep. you'll shed weight in seconds. <laughs> Forget the Not paleo possible. diet. The actor yeah, diet exactly. always works. <laughs> the actor slash musician diet yeah. in South Africa is highly effective. And uh, that relationship went by the wayside, obviously. And, <laughs> and imagine number I two would, gone. Yeah, exactly. This one wasn't so much a badger as a, um, I don't know what it was. Anyway, I... <laughs> I then went back to the bush to try and start up a community conservation project north of Palaboa on a place called the Lataba Ranch, which um, was just a minefield of politics and bribery and hunting corruption. And it was really just a nasty, nasty place. And that ended after a year. I was at a, at a complete loss. And mercifully, I got a job with Wild Earth back then. Unfortunately, we're all freelance now, but you know, we had a good, I had a good run of about four and a half years with Wild Earth where I was brought, we were broadcasting live on the internet every day. We did about 50 shows to National Geographic in the US out of the Maasai Mara as well during the migration. We did three years of migration there, which was spectacular. And then mostly out of Juma here. So that's, that's basically who I am and what I've been doing. Oh, and in the middle, I, I wrote a couple of books. Now, t tell me about the books, and then, then you've sort of glossed, well, not quite glossed over, but you haven't brought in Honey Badger number three, um, who oh, is well, far yeah, more no. permanent. Yes. Now, Honey Badger number three is, is entirely permanent. She's redheaded, so um, she's by far the most terrifying, <laughs> and um, she's, now, um, she's now my wife. Right. And um, she, she's currently in Johannesburg and longing to come and join me out here in the bush and hopefully we will settle somewhere wild one day and make so films. That's at cool. the moment you're in Juma and she's in Johannesburg, have, has this been the case since the beginning of lockdown or is... Uh, is no, this... it's actually been, no, it's been the case for the last week or so. Oh, okay. We were very lucky. We came, we went on honeymoon to the Khalakhadi where we camped, mm -hmm. which was, is a great test of any marriage. If anybody was getting about married and wants yeah. to know... <laughs> Yeah, if you if you really want to test your relationship, go camping on honeymoon. It's an excellent idea. Um, and we made a little series about that, which you can find on my YouTube page called Me, My Wife and the Wildlife. And it's a humorous look at uh, a honeymoon camping in the <laughs> bush where I borrowed my, my father-in-law very kindly lent me a vehicle and his camping trailer. We broke both. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did you at least bring his daughter back in one piece? I did. I brought her back in one piece, well, I think. Physically, best. yes. Mentally, yes. mentally, I'm not sure. <laughs> and then we, we were very lucky, you know, with one day to go to lockdown, because we were in Botswana on the Khalakhadi side with totally no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. We came out of the park and they said, you've got two days to get where you're going and then there's going to be lockdown. And thankfully, we had a contract here at Wild Earth with Juma. And so we drove through Kimberley from the Khalakhadi and got here with two hours to spare before lockdown began. Wow. And spent the first six, seven weeks of lockdown here, which was a mercy, a privilege, and just a really, I mean, I was truly grateful that we had the time here. You know, we worked, I had a job, for those seven weeks, so many people didn't. Yeah. I had the space to move, so many people didn't. I still don't, you know, I could go running when I wanted, I'd go for a walk when I wanted. Um, and mostly, however, you know, it was, it was a time when a lot of people were stuck in their homes, kids weren't going to school, and our audience 
exploded. You know, it went from a, you know about three thousand per drive to well over twelve thousand, and it was just a feeling of solidarity and like we were doing something important and useful and helpful uh, yeah. over that period. And it was really very special to be part of that and to be with so many people, you know, obviously virtually, but to be with them and to try and deliver some of nature, nature's healing power to them during that period was very special. And, and your audience is very loyal. I know I've spent time at Juma. I've, I've contorted myself into the back of one of those vehicles, which is not designed for three people. It's designed for no. a driver and a cameraman. It's not designed for yeah. an, an added journalist slash photographer. No. Um, and no. your, your control room literally controls your drive. Um, yeah. Because they will ask you questions or they will tell you if they don't think you're doing a good job. It's very absolutely. They're wonderful and difficult to deal with at the same time. Our audience, you mean? Yes, yes. The audience is—it's fascinating because it's like taking a massive game drive. And you know, I always used to say that when I was a guide, you get great stories out of guides, and they'll complain about guests, and they'll tell you about this guest did that, and this guest did that. But 95% of the guests you get are actually great. They're really nice people. They've come out to see the bush. They have a common interest. And really, they're fun. That 5% though makes up about 95% of the stories that you hear around the fire. And it's the same thing with our audience. Our audience is 98% people who are just fascinated in nature. There are, however, 2% who <laughs> really like to stick it to you if they think that you've done something wrong or I mean, I had a complaint the other day. What was it? And um, they said, some guy on Twitter, he had about eight followers. And he said, um, said something like, who is this horrendous, horrendous individual on camera? He should not never have been allowed into the bush. He should never have been allowed to guide. He's the worst thing that's ever happened to TV. And so it was something really vicious, you know. Mm. Uh, but those are so few and far between. So we don't but but the, the, the problem with those, and I've done shows where, where um, people have, you know, the, the online community has, has uh, uh, commented. And the problem is you're going along, you're thinking you're doing a wonderful job. And then you yes. see something like that. And whatever you've done to that point has gone out the window. Because yeah. now you focused on that one fellow with his eight followers who... Is never go, he's probably so jealous of the job that you're doing. You know, he's, yeah. he's probably an overweight car salesman somewhere in, the, in the America who voted for Trump. And he's got what he deserves, and now he's taking it out on you. <laughs> in, this, in this particular case, he was British, but he probably voted for Brexit. Close. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 But, um, you know, I've been very lucky in that I've taken relatively little abuse. There's going to be some abuse. One only, you can imagine what it must be like for a genuine celebrity. For the amount of um, hate mail that someone like Ryan Gosling gets, for example, I'm sure he doesn't deal with it. I'm sure he has people to deal with it. But yeah. what has been, is interesting really here, and I, I noticed this as a guide when I started, and that was 21 years, 20 years ago now, is that the misogyny is 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 distressing so the girl guides that we have here who i've always thought women make much better guides than men because they don't bring ego to the situation so they're never going to push an animal too close if the animal says go away they'll normally just go away they have no need to try and show them how you know show the animal their testosterone levels yeah but i found that the abuse online and when i was a you know guest driving guide the abuse that the women have to put up with is extreme sometimes, and often and from it, women. And it's uncalled for. I, I've, I've never understood yeah. that, you know. Yeah, yeah it's madness. I, it really I, is, especially as on our particular platform, you know, it's, it's totally free. So, yeah. you know, it's not like somebody paid to come on, on a drive <laughs> with somebody. Well, this, this is it. Really, yeah. We're giving it to you for nothing, so, and then you still want to complain about the people that you're not paying for. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know? yeah. But Locking it's not is always an option. 
But let's yes. just go back. Let's just go back to your books. I know you've recently yeah. published a book, which unfortunately neither you nor I currently have a copy no. of. No. Um, but let's talk mm -hmm. about that and talk about the others that you've written, James. The first one was a, uh, when the first writing effort was something called "Whatever You Do, Don't Run," and that was four of us that wrote that. Uh, all four of us um, worked at Ngala Game Reserve. And that was a collection of short stories that four of us put together. I wrote, I think it was three, yeah, three, um, and between three and four stories between the four of us. And it's a lovely book. It's out of print at the moment, I'm afraid. But um, that was my first foray into it. That was Indie Publishers. And then, you know, you sit around the fire with guides and you hear these stories and everybody says to you, well, you know, this really should be a book. Eventually, a friend of mine and I started writing what became A Year in the Wild. He couldn't finish it for various reasons, so we wrote about half of it together, and then I completed it. And that's just a fictional take about living in a game lodge, the crazy things that guests do, the crazy stuff that staff gets up to. Um, you know, the it's a really light-hearted look at what is essentially a, a wonderful way of life and the humor that goes around it, some of the tragedy, but mostly the humor. So that was A Year in the Wild, and then I wrote a sequel to that called Back to the Bush, Another Year in the Wild, and those are both Pan Macmillan, and they're still in print. You'll find those in bookshops or on Take a Lot. Okay. And then last year, this year, I published another one called Reggie and Me, and Reggie and Me is a total departure from the other two, it's, it started off as a non-fiction book about prejudice as I saw it in South Africa. And the publisher phoned me up one day and she said, you can't write this book. You're not the appropriate demographic to write this. You can't, as a privileged white male, be writing this book. So I accepted that and I wrote a fiction book about, because I, I was born in 1976 and I matriculated in 94. So it's quite a nice, you're looking at South African history, that's a nice mm. period. Um, well, it wasn't nice for everybody, but it's an interesting period. And so I wrote a fictional take about uh, a young or a white child, privileged, growing up in Johannesburg, and just placed it in the framework of South Africa at the time. And it's, it's supposed to be amusing. I, I mean, I think it is quite amusing in many respects. <laughs> But it's quite nice in that it it shows South Africa warts and all, uh, you know, as it was back then. And while, you know, the characters are, you can definitely identify with the characters and you can feel quite, quite a lot of warmth to them. The backdrop of South Africa is just that it makes you feel slightly uncomfortable the whole way through. And I think that's what I aimed for. Um, but in general, it's a coming of age tale about a kid, you know, who starts to become aware of himself and of privilege i don't know, you know that's that's reggie and me and I, I hope that it will be something that people will have a good laugh at and go and maybe have a bit of a think about too were you able to launch it before lockdown happened or did this go to i have i've had a remarkable run of luck um i was Married on the 7th of, so we launched the book on the 5th of March. I was married on the 7th of March. The wedding venue shut down the week after that, on the 14th. So we, I think, were the second last wedding that happened at the venue. And a week after that, or a week and a half after that, lockdown happened and we made it here. So we got in the launch, the wedding and the honeymoon just before lockdown occurred, and then we were very lucky to have the job yeah, over that period. So currently you're a you're a Juma. Um, yeah. What is what is a typical day for you? A typical day for me is I get up at about quarter past four, and I am pretty much asleep at that stage, so I have a brutally cold shower very quickly. And then I'll make some coffee and I do some I do some kind of artistic work at that stage. So I'll either write or I'll go through footage or I'll edit photographs. And then I go on game drive at 
between six and nine thirty, we do the the live drive, um, and then from sort of nine thirty to ten, we have breakfast, and then I'll be back at my desk at around ten. I'll do things like this, or well, not many things like this. It's quite unusual. I'll do some admin, answer some emails and that sort of stuff, and then I'll do some exercise at twelve o'clock. That's normally when I go out and either go for a run or we've got a small selection of weights and things here and i'll just do something to try and stay fit and then uh, have something to eat and then you know in winter you're pretty much ready to go back on drive and we kick off again at three o'clock so it, it looks like it's reasonably cold there i see you all wrapped up in a in a, it's a jacket not bad i mean i've just got a jersey on it's um oh. it's probably okay for me to take it off it's uh, probably about 20 degrees now Oh, well, that's, that's not, not too bad. shabby. Um, not at all. I was lucky enough to spend last week in the bush writing content for social media for a particular company. And I was able, because the lodge itself is actually shut to the public, I was able to change game drives to suit me. So I'd say I'm not going out at six o'clock in the morning in the four degrees or minus two. We're going to stay in the lodge. We're going to have breakfast first. And then we'll go out at like half past eight, like normal people. Yeah, now I think it's a good idea in winter, and I know some of the places in the Eastern Cape where I've been quite recently do exactly that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Quandwe in the Eastern Cape, that reserve. If you stay there in winter, they go yeah. out after breakfast. I think it's like nine or ten, yeah. and then they spend yeah. the whole day in the bush. But then you're yeah. back at like three three thirty before it's cold mm. again. But you've had yeah. lunch in the bush. You've had great ga a great game drive. And and you're warm yeah. in the morning and in the evening. I think it's a great way to do winter because it's winter in that way. area gets yeah. bitterly, bitterly cold. Yeah. I took my wife down there. She wouldn't speak to me for weeks afterwards, <laughs> but she does not like the cold. Um, so we went back the following year. So she didn't speak to me again, uh, which was one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll bear that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> James, what are the has have the wildlife sightings changed at all? I mean, for Juma, it's, it's different because you guys, it's it's not sort of a, a public property where there are dozens of vehicles all the time. Yeah. So the animals are used to maybe one or two vehicles, and nothing's really changed. Um, but are you still getting good sightings? I know the leopard sightings when I was up there were fantastic. They really and truly. We are still getting good sightings. I think that if there has been a change, it's been with the elephants, who seem to have become even more confiding than they are normally. And we've had them, you know, close by the vehicle, totally ignorant, ignorant, ignorant of the vehicles almost, just walking around them, ignoring them. Now, in the Sabi Sands, you do get that. I mean, that's not totally uncommon. It just feels like it's even more now. You know, we, you don't have a sighting where you call it in on the radio and three more vehicles come. Yeah. Where maybe the cat's driving too fast or his engine's too loud or his guests are too loud. You don't have that. So it's just us driving in, small car, not shouting, not making a big noise. And I think the elephants have responded to that. I don't know that anything else has really taken a huge amount of note. Um, I think everything else is pretty normal, but if there was a change, I'd say, I, I know the last time I was at Juma, and that's three, maybe four years ago, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, they were looking at using drones um, to get footage. I don't know how far that has come along. We used it quite a lot extensively um, in some of our Safari Live broadcasts, and we, we used a thermal drone for one of our shows specifically. It was called, called The Gauntlet or something equally to them. Um, yeah, I think it was called that. And we used it because we had feeds coming out of the Mara, which was light when we did the show. And it was all live, mm. uh, but it was dark at Juma. And obviously finding stuff at night is not easy. Yeah. You can't track. You can't, you know. And so we had this thermal drone uh, in oh. midwinter, which was fantastic. It found a lot of stuff for us. Um, and we, we have done some aerial stuff as well during our TV shows. Mm -hmm. but it's not it makes a lovely picture it really does and so you know when we can when we have used it it's been very effective 
but but the animals don't mind the noise i mean it sounds like a swarm of angry careful. bees now you've got to be very careful and um so it's it's always a long range shot it's never yeah. uh it's never a close in in shot because i mean the animals they get used to it in the same way they get used to the vehicles but they the sound is awful so if you're trying to it broadcast is. something it's, uh, it's just the sound is dreadful the best thing to do with the drone or the best thing that we did was to follow wild dogs on the hunt um because you can then be way above them and because they use their ears so much when they're hunting it it's actually much more sensitive than following them in a vehicle which is smashing bushes behind yeah. them. you know and they, you, if you watch dogs carefully when you follow them hunting I, I think that in a vehicle we often impact their ability to find each other because of the noise we um, and from the air, that doesn't happen. Now, I know where I was now, um, another 53-year-old wait came to an end. In um, November of last year, I found my first pangolin. And I'd waited 53 uh. years for that. And was lucky enough to spend an hour and a half with it. Um, the lodge very kindly left me together with a tracker sitting at the sighting. And then came back cool. to fetch us, which was cool. And then last week, very first drive, day before my, my birthday, we find an aardvark at four o'clock in the right. afternoon, just tootling down the side of the road without, we spent 20 minutes with it, without That's a care in the world. And would you believe two minutes, two days later, we found him again. That's amazing. Where was that? At, um, at um, Mabula. Was... James, I've, funny enough, I was joking about um, uh, Zoom. They've just sent me a message saying this, this will end in 10 minutes. So we've, okay. I, will, I will keep an eye on the clock. Um, and so we've still got another 10 minutes, but we've, we've yeah. had a good half an hour. So we can't yeah. complain um, too much about no. Zoom. Um, wh what are you going to be doing now going forward? Are you staying... Um, at Juma for the foreseeable future? Everything is a little bit in the air. Like I say, we're all freelance at the moment. Um, so, you know, I've got a bit of freelance work now. I'll have some freelance work um, with Juma into August and September. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will. And then, yeah, we don't really know at this stage. My wife and I are hopefully going to sell a few movie concepts or wildlife film concepts to broadcasters that, that's the idea You're right and hopefully we'll be able to go and shoot those um we've probably got a project up in choby in october which will be very special indeed and then i'm going to be doing some private guiding as well and i've got a private safari in october and another one in november to south african reserves mm -hmm. so this is COVID. COVID allowing, of course, All right. and then, yeah, a couple more next year. So between the filmmaking and the private guiding, that's hopefully where I'll I'll be focused over the next little while. And and no more books in the foreseeable future, or are you already starting oh, the next to, one? No, I would love to write some more. Um, again, though, you know, it's a bit like being a musician. If you want to get thin, I think you're going to make a living out of writing. Yeah, again, it's in South Africa, unless you're sort of a James Patterson or a Jonathan yeah. Kellerman who can sell 25 million copies in two weeks or churn out a book a year with those sort of numbers yeah. attached. Yeah. You know, South Africa, if you put, I think it's, it's a very tiny number that takes you into that stratosphere. And pe people yeah. think that writing is, is easy. A, it's not. Um, finding a publisher is not easy, and then selling the darn yeah. things is even harder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you end up with books of boxes of your own books in storage somewhere because you can't yeah. you can't yeah. give them away. <laughs> yeah. But you thought it was a no, good idea right. at the time. Do you yeah. interact with your audiences outside of sort of drive hours? If people send you emails, yeah. do do you sort of say hello back type of thing? Absolutely, I do. Um, I. I speak to them on social media on facebook and instagram um youtube and then if people send me an email i've got a website and which is jameshendry.co.za and there are contact details there and if somebody sends me a query or a compliment or 
something like that, then I will always reply. Um, at the moment, you know, I mean, yeah. it doesn't. I don't. It's not like I get thirty-five emails a day. Yeah. I get maybe on average two. Um, so it's not a. It's not a hassle to reply to people. Wait and I'm after. After this airs, James, you are going to be oh, flooded. Well, yes, no. Flooded. No, I'm going to be inundated. For, inundated. For you, you will have to hire an assistant for your assistant's yes. assistant to keep I'll up. Try with and her. get my wife to do that for me. Yeah. yeah. Your wife ends up in the control room. She doesn't want to, to be answering your emails. No, she doesn't at all. <laughs> She'd be much too honest about me. She, she would indeed. Your fan base would shrink almost instantaneously. Immediately. Yeah. <laughs> um, James, thank you so much for chatting with me. My it's pleasure. been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I wish you thank and you your wife all the very, very best going forward. And I'm hoping that uh, you and I will bump into each other at um, Safari Guide of the year 2020, yeah. 2020, 2020, 20 something, whatever it's going to be. Yes, yeah, it will be indeed. Thanks once again. Um, this has been in conversation with my guest today has been James Hendry, wearer of so many hats that there's no time to go through all of them. But look him up online, um, and more importantly, buy his book. He needs your money. Yes, James. Thank you for being a guest. Thank you very much. <laughs>